I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man can come to God except by me. There is no alternative. Do you know that 1,700 pastors left the ministry in just one month, every month of 2019 in the United States of America? Pause and think about that. That's just only pastors. We are not talking about music ministers. We are not talking about evangelists, apostles. We are not talking about those who are doing one thing or in the house of God. Think about it. The Bible makes us say that only those that endure to the end shall be saved. Have you ever been at the point of giving up? Has it been at any time that you considered even suicide? I've come to you today to tell you there's a way out. Ministry is not supposed to be unduly burdensome. But there are things we miss out that make it very, very difficult, nearly unbearable. But by the grace of God today, we shall see how we, how we can go through without becoming a victim of these things that make people to fall by the wayside. Remember, the Bible says the end of a thing is better than the beginning thereof. We have started well. I'm trusting God that by grace, grace, we shall finish well in the name of Jesus. Let me welcome you especially to this Labor Day Ministers Conference of 2021. And I'm glad that you are here. And I'm here also to say, Happy Laborers Day. Because as far as I'm concerned, you are the greatest workers on earth. You are the employees of the Most High, though you are also sons. And I do understand also that you are the people that are making the world to run. I tell people, I say, look, by the time we foolish people are gone, the world cannot last because wise people cannot live together. <laughs> It's only those of us who are foolish, who are still here, that are keeping the world running. And I want you to know that God has a better plan for you, possibly than what you are experiencing now. God helping us, we shall go through that today. But as I speak, I want to read the scripture to you now, which I want you to respond to in the chat box. If you have ever had this kind of feeling in your life, as a minister, it doesn't matter the position you occupy. I want you to just signify in the chat box, either by raising your hand in the box or by just saying, yes, listen to this. <clears throat> Why was I born? Was it only to have trouble and sorrow? To end my life in disgrace? I read it again. Why was I born? Was this only to have trouble and sorrow? To end my life in disgrace? Listen to me. This was a man of God, proven prophet of God talking here. This is Jeremiah for your information. He couldn't see a future for himself. He couldn't see a future for his ministry. He thought it was all a waste of time. He couldn't understand why he was even born in the first case. To help you further, Maybe I should go up a little bit. For your information, I'm reading from the book of Jeremiah chapter 20. This time around, I'm going to start from verse 15. I'm going to start from verse 15. He said, Cause be the one who made my father glad by bringing him the news. It's a boy. You have a son. I'm reading from good news. Is that maybe, is that may he be like those cities that the Lord destroyed without mercy? May, the, may he hear cries of pain in the morning and the battle alarm at noon. Excuse me, what has this person done to Jeremiah? When you see ministers cursing people, when you see them asking that people be killed, is as a result of what many are going through. They still love God, they are still serving God. But we don't want to, to end that way or to, pro progress, to proceed along that path. That's why I congratulate you for being here today. It's another Labor Day that we are celebrating, Labor Day rather, because it's your day. And my desire 
is for you at all costs, by the grace of God, to be able to make it to the end and make it your will in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Listen to Jeremiah speaking on. He said, may, may, may he hear the cry of pain in the morning and the battle alarm at noon for not killing me before I was born. Then my mother's before killing before, before I was born, then my mother's womb will have been my grave. And I said, why was I born? Was it only to have trouble and sorrow to end my life in disgrace? I want to let you know. The Bible says the Comforter has come. The Holy Ghost from heaven. The Father's promise given. So go and tell the tardy that the Comforter has come. And it's to that intent I've come today to share with you on what I titled Revising for Refreshing. But before we begin to refresh, we need to revise all those things that we may have known. We need to remind ourselves. We need to be sure that we are not just having them in our heads, we are applying them to our lives. Let me quickly share with you a few more damning statistics. He said, 1,700 pastors left the ministry every month in the year 2019 in the United States of America. 1,700. I didn't say 17. 1,700. And we'll trace it. Why? 50% of pastors indicated that if they had other means of income, they would quit the ministry. So over half of pastors are in need just for the money. That's quite unfortunate. And that tells a lot about our foundations. However, that's the reality of the statistics. 50% of them said, guy, if I've got any other thing doing, I have, I, I'm out of here. I'm not going to continue doing this business of preaching because they are tired, they are fatigued. <laughs> Another one, 57% of pastors, they feel fulfilled. At the same time, they are discouraged, they are stressed, and they are fatigued. If you, can, if you can connect to this, please just signify in the chat box. 35% of pastors, listen to this, 35%, that is more than one in every three pastors battle depression or fear of inadequacy. 35% of pastors, listen, we are talking just about pastors, and they are the cream a la cream of the people that we refer to that are in the ministry, at least as this, we socially portray them. And yet, it is this terrible. Hallelujah. But I want to tell you that there is hope. If you believe, say amen. <laughs> Glory to God. There is hope. Hallelujah. He said, there shall be showers of blessing. This is the promise of God. There shall be seasons refreshing. Come from the Savior above. Showers of blessings. Showers of blessings we need. Mercy drops round us are falling. Bed for the showers we plead, and the showers are coming today in the name of Jesus. I say you will be nourished, you will be refreshed, you will be revitalized, you will be reactivated, you will be revigorated to be able to do that, that for which you are born, for which you have been called, for which you have been endowed, for which you have been empowered by the Most High God. That's why we are here, and my God will strengthen you, He will re energize you. You know, when footballers are playing and they go for the, for, for the halftime, they go and rejuvenate, they you know. They take whatever they need to take, drink some water, relax, rest. Then when they come back, it's like they are starting afresh. Glory to God. That is what my God is going to do. Even much more than that, is what my Father is going to do for you this day in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Let me tell you a little more. About 28% of pastors also report that they are spiritually undernourished. And we're going to talk about how to deal with all these things. 70% also of them say they continually have issues at pertaining to depression in one form in one form or the other. Hallelujah. But why am I giving all these damning statistics? To let you know if you are in the situation that you are not alone, I'm not saying you should stay there, but you cannot afford to be there again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But to let you know that you are not alone, that's number one. Number two is for you to know how much of the workforce is being depleted while we still think we have them. When somebody is doing a job that he would rather do another one, he cannot be at his best. And half of the pastors are saying, look, if I've got another means of income, I don't want to do this job again. 
That tells you, that tells on the effectiveness of the church. It tells on the effectiveness of the ministry. Hallelujah. And that's why we need to come together in such a time as like this and to gather like half time and have this pep talk to encourage ourselves that we should keep on. We should fire on. There's a song that says, we should not give up because our redemption is drawing near. It's just a little more. See, just a little longer. When the trump of God shall sound, just a little longer, when we all be glorified, look away to heaven, our redemption draweth nigh. Just a little longer, we shall meet him in the sky. So we don't have forever to endure. We don't have forever to go through all these things that we are going through. It's just a little more. And I know that our God is going to give us the grace. He will give us all it takes to be able to take us through in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Praise God. But today we want to talk about how we can have a happier workers' day next year. When we come together in great celebration to say, yes, indeed, 2021, as from the day that we had the Labor Day Minister Conference till now, 2022, God has been awesome in my ministry. i have been awesome in my family, in my life, because these things have to be addressed. If we keep pushing them under the carpet, we will keep deceiving ourselves. The Bible says already, Jesus himself says, laborers are few, and these are the statistics of the few laborers. Half are demotivated completely. A lot are battling depression. A lot of them would rather do another thing than the ministry. This is how severe a situation the church has found itself. But there's hope. Hallelujah. The Bible says there's hope of a tree. Look at Joe 47. There's a hope of a tree. As long, even if it's cut down, as long as its root is still in the ground, my purpose for you today is to help you to still have your root in the ground. So that you can, at the scent of water, sprout up it. Somebody say, I'm sprouting again. If you are that person, let me see you in the, in the chat box. I'm the one, I'm sprouting up again. I am not giving up. I am not going to let go. I'm not going to let God down. I'm not going to disappoint God. I will not disappoint those God has sent me to. I'm not going to give up because I know he that has sent me is more than able to see me through. We don't only, we are not supposed to be quoting the scripture. Get that he that's in me. That he that is in the world, only when we have opposition from people, but when we have opposition from ourselves, it is time also we spoke those things to ourselves. Greater is it as in me than whatever feeling I'm having. I am not a man of feeling. I'm a man of the spirit. I'm a man of faith. I refuse to give it to what I'm saying. I give it to what God has said. Hallelujah. Glory to God. These are things that you know, but we need to remind ourselves how to bring refreshing. Look at what happens in the afternoon, like I tell you, when you are playing a game. A lot of things that they have been told, they have been told before, they had known them, but they need to be reminded. They need to be told again so that it will be easy for them to apply right here and now and deal with the present situation. We are in a, 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 an emergency case as a church, brethren. This is an emergency case as a church. And I know by the grace of God, by the things we're going to be hearing today, we are going to all be helped. We are going to be strengthened. We are going to be re-energized in the name of Jesus. Glory to God. So I want to say again, happy workers day. And I'm trusting God for more grace to do more in his vineyard. Hallelujah. Now revising for refreshing. Revising simply means to look over something you have known before or you have written down before. So I'm not going to say, some, I'm not going to be saying things that are very new, Amen. but we need to remind ourselves to help us. Hallelujah. Then when you say something is refreshing, that means it has a renewing effect on your, the state of your body, not on your body, but the state of your body and the state of your mind. That is exactly what it means that you are refreshed. For example, you have worked all day, you are tired. Fortunately, you are able to have a very good rest in air-conditioned room. You are able to relax well, no noise, nothing. By the time you wake up the following morning, you feel young, you feel strengthened. You feel a new vibe on your inside. You, you experience new vitality. You are revigorated. That is what we are believing God in this conference today, in the name of, that's what we are believing God for in this conference today, in the name of Jesus. Glory to God. So, and I saw another meaning of refreshing, which is more elaborate. It says it's the satisfying comfort that you receive in the midst of overwhelming weariness, misery, hunger, thirst, loneliness, darkness, 
and restlessness. These are markers that we need refreshing. When you find yourself overwhelmed by the work of the ministry, when you find yourself being weary, you see yourself losing strength rapidly. You are not able to cope with what you need to handle. You see yourself also being miserable. You feel hopeless. You feel that you are not equipped to do what you need to do. You, you are hungry and there is no food. You are thirsty and there is no drink. You are lonely, most importantly. We're going to touch more about that. Praise God. You see darkness all around you. You feel restless. You, got, you are just making the motions, but there's no movement. Praise God. So it is, it is at that time that you need exactly to do something about it. And you do not need to wait or it becomes an emergency. I'll be touching on that also as we proceed. What do you stand to gain from all these things? Is to be able to equip yourself so that at the very worst, you can nip this at the bird so that you will not be a victim of these things that we are talking about and that you can be there also to strengthen others. I want to let you know that having these feelings are not necessarily sinful. They are human. Hallelujah. Not necessarily sinful, but they are human. There is need for us to strengthen ourselves so that we will not be victims of depression, we will not be victims of giving up in any way whatsoever. We saw a case of another prophet. I just read to you from Jeremiah by Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. But we saw another case of Elijah, one of the most prominent prophets of all time. This man so served God that the Bible even recorded that he was taken to heaven alive. <laughs> Glory to God. However, before he's been taken, he got to the point of being suicidal. He was at a state of full depression. Why? So many things came together against him. So many things. He said in chapter 19, verse 4, he said, God, I am not better than my fathers. Those stories who are telling me that I will get to heaven and the rest of them without seeing death. Look, forget it. Let me die the way my father has died. <laughs> I'm tired. If it's going to cost this much, just take away my life because I'm not better than my father's. He was becoming suicidal. In fact, he became completely suicidal because he was overwhelmed. But like I said, we have to look beyond ourselves. And let's quickly analyze that case. You realize that Elijah was in that position. Why? Because he began to remove focus from the Lord. It didn't appear completely. But we need to look between the lines, to be able to see what I'm talking about. In the book of 1 Kings, chapter 18, verse 22, Paul said, Hi, even I only, I'm the only prophet of God that remains. Nobody else is for God. I'm the only one that has not bought my need to buy, to bail, rather. And God answered, You joke, boy. If there is only one, I am the only one. You cannot be the only one. There are not two only ones. <laughs> Hallelujah. I, the Lord, I'm the only one. By the time you are feeling that you are the only one, then you are already going to depression. <laughs> Praise God. Because I can only you change your world. I can only you change a nation, given to corruption, given to idolatry, given to all manners of evil. Only you. As anointed as you, you can think you are. So it becomes too overwhelming that to even do the little you can becomes a big task. Glory to God. And I don't know whether you're in that position today, that you have been overwhelmed by the enormity of the work that you need to do in the Nigerian church or in the church of God universally. You are asking yourself, how much can I do? Jesus told them in John chapter 6, what do you have? Bring it. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So you will do well to write down what you got. I got my voice. Hallelujah. I can talk. Glory to God. I can read back, I can pray. That is it. Bring what you, can, you have. Then I will supply the rest. Glory to God. But until you bring what you have, you will not have any other one. Because the Bible says, unto whom much, much is expected. And it also makes us to understand that when you receive whatever you have, if you don't use it well, it said they will be taken from your hands. But you use it well. We saw all, the, all those that used those things well, they were able to receive even multiples of them back. So when you bring what you have, God will multiply it. When they brought what they had, two fish and five loaves of bread. That was only enough for a small boy to eat. <laughs> Hallelujah. But Jesus says, what do you have? Bring it. I know you don't have enough, but you trust me with what you got. I know somebody's women start to hear. Hallelujah. Trust me what you got. Don't be overwhelmed by it. what ought to be done. Don't worry. Let's introduce me to the, what is overwhelming you. It can't be greater than me. 
It is when you match yourself and what you have with what you are facing that you are overwhelmed. You cannot be overwhelmed. In fact, you'll be excited when you introduce what you are facing to your God who cannot be overwhelmed. Glory to God. Men of God, women of God, I want to appeal to us not to think too much of ourselves because many times, unconsciously, we are too busy. From one program to the other, we are preparing some of us. Every time we read Bible, it's just because we want to preach. So we are not being ministered unto. We forget we are first sons before we are servants. Glory to God. So we must give preference to our position as sons. Glory to God. It is the platform on which we stand as true servants. If we are serving without giving respect to that position of sonship, then we are turning ourselves to hirelings who only are doing it for profit. Glory to God. And that ought not to be our motive. God will take care of us. Of us. He will meet our needs. That's the truth. If we are not greedy, he will meet our needs. He will take care of us. Glory to God. If only we can serve him faithfully and give him time. Hallelujah. Because God is a God of process. I always tell people, the only tree that, that, that grew up in one day died the same day. The tree that covered Jonah. He died in one day because he didn't go through process. Look at Adam. Adam was born an adult. And that was why he failed. That was why when the last Adam was coming, he came as a son. He came as a child. Hallelujah. He had to go through process. The Bible says he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. Hallelujah. But Mr. Adam just appeared from nowhere. Glory to God. He, he, there was no growth. There was no process. And that was why it was very easy for him to fail. Listen to me, brethren. God is a God of process. Let's give him time as we serve him faithfully. The Bible says it's a reward of them that diligently seek him. Are you seeking him diligently? I can guarantee just give him time. It will come true for you and come true it will in the name of Jesus. Glory to God. So it's important for us not to be victims as the great man. So what I'm, why I'm bringing these examples, these are great men of God. The Bible attests to them. Great men of God. Elijah, we are talking about, uh, about uh, uh, Jeremiah. These are great prophets. And yet these things happen to them. So what I'm saying is this, that the fact that we are anointed does not mean we are immune from these things. <laughs> In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 9, the Bible says those things that, 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 apply, that, that happen to our brethren in the world, they apply to us also. The only difference is that we have the grace to deal with them. Jesus said in John 16, 33, he said, in this world we have tribulation, but be of good cheers because I've, I've, I've overcome the world. He didn't say you will not have a problem because you, have now belong, you now belong to me. He didn't say everything will be rosy rosy because you now belong to me. In fact, he said in first, second Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, he said, for those that will live godly, they will suffer persecution. It's not easy. Glory to God. But he said, I, through the thick and thin, I will be with you. He is the God that is with us in the water and in the fire. And that is our assurance. That is the strength that we have. That is the advantage that we have over those who don't have him. It's not as though we are immune from those things, but he says he will give us the grace to carry us through. And that grace is just today in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So when refreshing comes, when refreshing becomes an emergency, is what I want to share with us now. How does refreshing become an emergency? We ought not to allow it to become an emergency. All right? But I know that's where many of us are. So we have to start as of tutorial. Because this is not the first lesson. It's supposed to be a tutorial. Because some of us are already neck deep into these things. So you're going to see yourself and see what you can do. Number one, when you are overworking, no holiday. Listen, you are not Holy Spirit. And you cannot ever be. <laughs> you only have Holy Spirit. Even the Bible says, in the book of uh, Exodus chapter 31, that God himself, in Exodus 31 verse 17, the Bible said, God walked, he created the heaven and earth in seven days, and he rested on the seventh day, then he was refreshed. Glory to God. I'm sure that it was not because God needed it. He was giving us an example. I think so. He was showing us how he wanted us to live. Glory to God. He said, God rested, then he was refreshed. And he now gave it as a command in the book of Exodus 23. He said, there in verse 12, he said, we also, I mean, sorry, talking to the 
children of Israel. He said they should observe the Sabbath day so that them and their and their workmen can rest so that they can be refreshed. Hallelujah. Rest is good. Hallelujah. Rest is important. We, can, we have to balance zeal with knowledge. Hallelujah. Yes, we want to do great things for God and the rest of them, but the same God wants us to also observe rest. He gave us an example of how to rest in Matthew 14, verse 22. I hope we are taking down these scriptures. You know, our time is highly limited online. It's online. When we meet physically, we can have a little time to dig it down. Hallelujah. But I'm trusting God to help us. Please take the scriptures down and study them after now. In John 14, 22, after they had finished the uh, feeding of 5,000 and the rest of them and the miracle, now the Bible says Jesus constrained them, his disciples, because they had been laboring. You know, it was because even this, the disciples came to tell Jesus, look, these guys have been with us for three days now. They've not eaten anything. So that meant that they couldn't have eaten themselves. And they were ministering to them for those days. The Bible says immediately Jesus constrained them to enter to the, into the boat and go to the other side. He constrained them. Listen to me. Now the Holy Spirit is on your inside. You should know when to constrain yourself by the power of the Holy Ghost to take rest. Please never think that you are a superman by not resting. Rest is good for your body. When we refuse to rest, it affects us negatively. And we become less useful to God when we are trying to be more useful. Praise God. So we see there that Jesus constrained them. And a powerful lesson followed it in that same uh, book. A powerful lesson followed it for Peter. Immediately they entered, the Bible said there was turbulence. And when there was turbulence, what happened to Peter? Peter said, they said, Jesus was left, he was praying. So in the middle of the night, they saw him walking on water. They said, what is this? He's a ghost. He said, no, it's not a ghost. I am the one. He said, okay. Are you the one? He said, yes, I am. I'm Jesus. He said, okay. Then Peter said, if it is you, bid me come. Jesus said, okay, come. And the Bible said he stepped out of the boat and he was walking on water until what happened? Until a point when the Bible said the wind became boisterous. I want to show you the things that take our attention from God. We look at what is happening around. You look at the person you started ministry together with, who is now flying around in private jets. You don't have the same commission. You don't have the same destiny. You don't have the same purpose in the hands of God. God has his purpose for him. He has his purpose for you. And he will equip you to the extent of his work for you. And it is what he gives you that you ought to be doing. So he looked around, said, what's happening here? The Bible said when he saw the wind burst us, what happened? He started doing what? He started sinking. <laughs> Glory to God. He started sinking. Glory to God. He started sinking. What? But I thought Jesus said I should come. But definitely it was proven that he already walked on water. Hallelujah. He walked on water. But when he looked around, let me ask you a question, laborer in the vineyard of God. My question, what has boisterous wind got to do with walking on water? Answer that question. I want to see your charts. <laughs> what has boisterous wind got? What I mean is, let's assume there is no boisterous wind. Can you walk on water? Naturally. What am I saying to you, laborer in the vineyard of God? Many things that overwhelm us, that make us weary and hopeless and despair that there's no future for us in ministry, that make us to throw in the tower and say, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. Listen, there are things that have no impact they, or they are inconsequential as far as our assignments are concerned. But because we think those things are important, that's why they overwhelm us. For example, somebody starting a ministry. See, I'm tired. I've been looking for money to buy band sets for how many months? I can't see. I'm not doing it again. Who told you band sets must be in the ministry? We need to check ourselves again. We've got a lot of things that are weary, making us weary, that are way, that, are, that things that are weighing us down. There are things that are inconsequential as far as God is concerned and the assignment he has given unto us. God has given us an assignment. We ought to find out from him, how do I go about this assignment? It is not how do people do it. It's, that is not my business. 
They didn't send me. Glory to God. They did not send me. I got to him that I, I sent me. How, daddy, do you want me to do this? It is not how are they doing this. Don't look around and say, no, I can learn from people, but I don't do it the way they are doing it because they didn't send me. They are not my examiner. I am going to be examined by he that sent me. He is God. I cannot write damp in my house and mark it myself and give myself admission. I may be more brilliant than those that have results. If I, it is not jam that set the question and mark it, if it's not the examination body that set it and mark it, I can't have their certificates. Praise God. So even if men are clapping for me, the best preacher in town, the greatest pastor on earth, if he that sent me, he said, no, 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 no. I didn't send you, send you to do that. This is what I sent you to do. I'm a failure. Glory to God. I'm saying we should be wary of making ourselves to be under undue pressure because of how people do it. Because that's not what God is going to ask us. Know that he that has sent us is with us. Glory to God. And he will provide everything that we need to do the work. So I want to put it to you that boisterous wind had nothing to do with working on water. Whether there was boisterous wind or not, it had nothing to do. Okay, now, if you say there's nothing... It has to do with it. Now, go to a river tomorrow, all right, and walk on it, and let's see whether it is boisterous wind that, that was absent that kept him walking. That that kept him walking till now, we keep him to the end. But he was the one that was looking elsewhere. May the Lord grant us grace to be focused on him. Somebody has said, lack of focus is why men fail. May the Lord grant us grace to look away from those distractions and focus on him, on him completely. You know, there's a song that says, the song says, uh, uh, is that, look fully into the, uh, 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 shorting with Jesus. Look fully into his, uh, into, his, into, his, into his gaze. And the things of this world will go dim in the light of his glory and grace. Look fully into the earth of the Lord. Behold his majesty on his, head, on his face. And every other thing that is burdening you, they will just filter away. Because it's bigger than all those things. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now, so what, do, what was he supposed to do? I'm talking about Elijah now. Talking about uh, Peter. They were supposed to refocus on God. The God that sent them. Go back to him. It's not working. Lord, this is what I'm experiencing. I didn't know it's going to be like this. How do I go about it? It's very important. And it's also important for us to have people in our lives who speak into our lives. To have people in our lives who have gone ahead. That you can climb on their shoulders. And you'll be like stars. If people say you are star, you are great. They don't know that. <laughs> because you are climbing on someone's shoulder, you are even taller than the person you are standing on the shoulder, but you, on your own, you cannot reach even the ankle. <laughs> Praise God. That is, what it, that is what it means to have a mentor, to have somebody who speaks into your life. But because everybody wants to be champion, we think we are too big to submit to authorities. May the Lord help us in the name of Jesus. Also going forward, then what, what, can, what could you have done? What could have done is for him to refocus on the Lord. Because when he was going to refresh him, in Acts chapter 3, verse 19, Peter was talking to the people of Israel, and he told them they should repent that, a time of, that times of refreshing should come from the presence of the Lord. Now, that means that refreshing comes from the presence of the Lord. And in, Mark, in Psalm 16, verse 10, the Bible says, in the presence of God, there is fullness of joy. And at his uh, right hand are pleasures forevermore. So that tells me, according to Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, Nehemiah 8, 10 says in the fourth part of that verse, he said, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So if there is joy in the presence of God and the joy of the Lord is my strength, so when I feel faint and weary, when I feel powerless, when I feel sick and tired, then I have not being conscious of God's presence. I may be there, but I'm, if I'm not conscious, I will not be able to see. I will not be able to partake of that joy. What I'm saying is this. Since time of refreshing comes from the presence of the Lord, that is where we ought to be. So anytime I'm having these feelings that we are talking about, the feelings of hopelessness and the rest of them, the feeling of being a complete miserable failure, you can't see the way forward. Labor and divine of God. I want to put it to you that it is most likely that we have actually escaped God's presence. We may not have done it. We may not have done it knowingly or willingly. 
but maybe circumstances or like I said, you know, Paul said in first in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 28, he's talking about the daily need of the churches. I mean, normal daily ranks of duty of ministry can be very, very demanding and tyrannical at times. You have to break yourself away from it. Look at when Jesus constrained them. It, I think it was the same story he repeated. It was repeated in Mark chapter 6. Yes. In Mark chapter 6. What the Bible said there was, he told them, get ye aside a little while and take a rest. The Bible said, because there were still people going and coming. That means if you are waiting for when there will not be ministry work, you will never rest. And this is where it ends. We are losing more than half of people that God has called and anointed and sent to the field on a yearly basis. Even those that are remaining are just doing it because of the money that is there. How can we be effective when the heart is not there? It's just about the money. Praise God. But God is changing somebody's mind today to serve God for who he is and trust him to take care of him and be focused again on God and be effective in the ministry as never before. Our intention today is to rejuvenate you, to help to be rejuvenated, to be revigorated so that when you stand up from where you are seated today watching this program, you will go with new zeal, zest and vigor and vitality and zest to pursue the cause of God that you has set for your life. And so shall it be in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, my Lord. Amen. Now, going forward, we need to be conscious of God's presence, like I said, because this man, Peter, forgot that he was looking at Jesus like this. How can you sink in his presence? He forgot that. He forgot that he was in prison. So being in the presence of God does not mean you tap into that joy that gives you strength. You have to be focused on him and be conscious. That consciousness is very critical. That is one of the most important things in the New Testament. A lot of people pray, oh, I cover my head with the element of salvation. I cover my waist with the belt of the truth. I, look, that is not what the Bible is talking about. It's asking you to be conscious that you are saved. Don't let the devil tell you are not born again. Hallelujah. That is, that is element of salvation. It's, that is how New Testament operates. It's a consciousness. Paul said, and we know. And, oh, God, Listen, he said, and we know. We are not in doubt. We are sure of what we are talking about. Glory to God. It doesn't matter what we are seeing around. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God and to them who are the called according to his word. We know it. We are not guessing. We are not trying to believe it. We, we are sure. Glory to God. That is being conscious. So when contrary winds blow, he said, and we know. Look at how Peter, I mean, Paul, and do the case of his own storm in Acts 27. In Acts 27, what did he do? When the storm came, he spoke in the midst of the storm to the people in the ship. He said, the angel of the Lord, whose I am and whose am I, who, who I serve, whose I am and who I serve, appeared to me and told me, no life will be lost. Hallelujah. When you see yourself giving up, despairing, when you see yourself thinking that you are born to be disgraced, you are born that shame will finish your life, that your ministry will end in shame, tell the devil and all the demons who speak to you, God told me in Romans chapter 8 that, as, that, that those whom he had foreknown, he had also presented 29, and those he had presented, he, had also, he has also called, those he has called, he has justified, those he has justified, he has already glorified, he is not going to glorify them. So my head is secure. Glory to God. He has glorified me. My head has crossed the line, so I have won the race. I am not struggling to win. Glory to God. We walk from the answer. Hallelujah. God, Hallelujah. We walk from the answer. I am not trying to win the race. I have won, but I need to wear that consciousness. So when the enemy is telling me, are you, you can't finish, look at you. Look at this. Look at that. Look at your mates. Look at this. You repeat what God has said. That was what Paul did in Acts 27. Paul did not say, hey, they me by me. Ah, I'm in trouble. No, 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 no. He repeated what God told him. When he said it, it came to pass exactly as God said. Hallelujah. But I want to put it to you also, in case you're already sinking. Because you have lost focus of Jesus. You are not conscious that he's there for you. If in case you are in that position that Peter was, the Bible said, Peter said, Lord, save me. Hallelujah. 
Glory to God. Lord, save me. And what happened? My master, my loving savior, stretched his hand. It is a useless boy. Good for you. Just perish so that others can learn. When he stretched his hand, will somebody stretch your hand today? Will you stretch your hand? Can you just stretch your hands towards the screen where you're watching now? As I minister to you before I continue. Libra kata yeke zuzia. Vivra kata yaba shonta libahe. Ma brada kayente libro shete yagada. In the name of Jesus, every weary soul receive refreshing by the power in the word and in the name and the spirit of Christ. Be revived. Be rejuvenated. Be revigorated. Be re-energized in the name of Jesus. Be reanimated in the name of Jesus by the power of resurrection. Receive fresh life. Receive fresh life in the name of Jesus. Receive fresh unction. New unction. Every stainless is gone now. In the name of Jesus, be quickened. Even in your mortal bodies. Even let your soul be quickened to do the work of the ministry as never before with a new zeal as you have never known before. In the name of Jesus Christ, as you are stretching your hands symbolically, I stretch my hands symbolically as well. As Jesus lifted Peter from being, from being destroyed in the sea, from sinking and perishing in the ocean of, of life, now I lift you up. In the name of Jesus, you are not going down again. You are not going down again. You are being lifted. You are revived. You are renewed. You are revitalized in the name of Jesus. You are not going down again. Go up and don't come down in Jesus' name. It is well with you. We cannot continue with this very weak workforce. There's so much to do, and we cannot continue this way. We cannot. Glory to God. So Jesus helped him, and he's going to help you. In fact, he has helped you already. If you believe it, say amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So if you find yourself in this situation, a situation where you remove your focus from the Lord is a consciousness because he's present with us. You know, he told, he told Moses in Exodus chapter 20, 33, verse 14, there about. He said, my presence will go with you. Now, as for us, his presence is in us and it's with us. Hallelujah. So all we need to do is to be conscious. It is not enough that he's with us. Like I've said, we have to have that consciousness. I don't have to feel him. I don't need to have good swimples. I don't need to feel anything. I, I, it doesn't matter. I prayed somewhere and uh, somebody, will, things happened. And a son of mine came to me after I was sir, did God tell you to pray that you, that person would be here? I said, no, he didn't have to. He has said it already in the Bible. Uh, he said, okay, how did you feel? I said, I didn't feel nothing. Did you see the person I prayed for fall down or shake? He said, no. Did, was he here? He said, yes. He said, that's how God works. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Listen, you don't need to feel anything. This is not Old Testament. We are you need to touch and feel and taste before you know that God is available. You need mantle, you need oil, you need everything before you can know that God. No! When did you see God, Jesus, using any paraphernalia? When? Because it's the spirit of life. The Bible says it's a quickening spirit. First Corinthians 7, 14, 45 to 40, 47. Is the quickening spirit himself. is the one that gives life. Glory to God. And that's what we need. Ask him to breathe on you afresh. Hallelujah. And you will see how animated you will become in the name of Jesus. So as for those, next thing is our work. I've talked about that. You have to take rest. All right? Rest. Take time to rest physically. Because when you don't rest physically, it will affect your mind ultimately. But the physical rest is the least of our rest. <laughs> Hallelujah. And when you remove your focus from Christ, please make sure you become conscious again. Now, but next, of all the things, when these things become an emergency, getting refreshed become an emergency, is when we give in to normal ministry work overload. Like I said, 7 Corinthians 11, 28. Normal ministry, no normal, but we are consuming them so much, we no longer have time to pray. We don't have time to fast as we used to. We don't have time to stay in God's presence. We don't have time to do all those things again. So we are, you know, it's like our batteries are not recharged. That's my point. Our batteries are not recharged. So at the end of the day, we are working on a weak battery. And we don't see results. And it becomes increasingly worse and worse. And the next thing is people start throwing in the tower. But no longer will that be your case. In the name of Jesus Christ. I'm the way. 
I am the truth. I am the life. No man can come to God except by me. There is no alternative. 